So looks time to start, right? Everyone can hear me? I have the phone unplugged. I got the horse right here. His name is Paul Revere. Okay. Um, first off, I want to talk about a little bit of biochemistry. Uh, people probably know about amino acids pretty well. Um, amino acids are pretty simple molecules uh, with an, uh, what's called the alpha carbon and attached to it is an amine or a nitrogen group and a carboxyl group and then a side chain. And unless the side chain is an H, uh, you have four distinct uh, um, bonds. Uh, these are covalent bonds, of course. Uh, the shared electronegativity uh, by the way Pauling defined it. Uh, if you put your four fingers uh, down on each hand, and put your two hands together, you can touch your four fingertips together with corresponding fingers. If you try to lay your hand over your other hand, it won't work. Um, it, you can't get a, a matchup. Your left hand and your right hand are geometrically distinct. Now, if you imagine this, you can take a glove on your right hand and turn it inside out. It will become a left-handed glove. And uh, another little topological thing, you can just see it if you look at it. So anyway, uh, if you put a pure crystal, a geometrical um, an atomer or isomer uh, into a solution and put... Uh, um, polarized light through it, it will rotate the light in a certain direction. You put the other symmetrically uh, mirror image uh, uh, the molecule, which is structurally identical except for the geometry, um, uh, orientation of the geometry being like an inverse um, tetrahedron, uh, then uh, you'll get rotation in the opposite direction. Uh, Louis Pasteur discovered this. He had uh, tartaric acid, and it had crystallized, and he was very observant and noticed that the crystals were opposite. Some of the crystals were one way and some another, and he painstakingly separated them out and put them in solution and figured this out. Um, I have a cat crying in the background. I don't know if you can hear it. Anyway, um, Amino acids are um, quite important in life. Uh, you spend a lot of your time seeking them in your diet, and uh, you have 10 essential amino acids. Um, the ones uh, that we're going to be particularly interested in, you can classify them in different um, ways. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at aromatic, and they're pretty hydrophobic. Uh, meaning they don't like water. They're more lipophilic or fat-soluble. And um, um, phenylalanine tryptophan is interesting. It's a precursor for serotonin. And then tyrosine, which is not an essential amino acid, but uh, will be of interest. So I wanted to introduce this this way. Uh, tyrosine has made me everything I am today, <laughs> and you too. Uh, you couldn't live without it. Uh, it's a, a phenylalanine, let's start with that. It's in all kinds of things that are rich in protein. And um, you can always get it from aspartamine, or aspartame, I guess, aspartamine, aspartame, aspartame. Uh, it's called this uh, commercial uh, sweetener. Uh, which is a dimer of phenylalanine and aspartic acid. In your body, your, your uh, 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 um, enzymes break, hydrolyze these uh, two, but I have it drawn here with a little arrow on the phenylalanine and the um, 
aspartic acid. Um, and if you peel off a water molecule and stick those uh, uh, um, that nitrogen directly to the carbon that that uh, oxygen is on on the aspartic acid, you'll get as as aspartame. I, f I'm, I should, really should learn to how to pronounce these sweeteners. Uh, and um, it's uh, there are people that can't take this. Uh, there's this enzyme, uh, phenylalanine is a, an essential amino acid. You can't synthesize it. You need it for proteins, but um, you can hydroxylase it, uh, hydroxylize it with an hydroxylase, phenylalanine hydroxylase. And if you look at the molecule on the right, uh, at the very bottom, um, uh, in I guess the uh, uh, para position is an hydroxyl group, which renders it just a little more soluble in water, but it's still uh, lipophilic, uh, and both these pass the blood-brain barrier easily. Uh, lipophilic molecules tend to pass through the blood-brain barrier pretty easily. Um, but anyway, there are people that have a disease called phenylketonuria. It's a genetic disease where they do not have a functioning a phenylalanine hydroxylase. And uh, if that's not detected at, um, uh, really at birth, early in development, uh, then um, they will build up toxic levels of phenylalanine and have uh, mental retardation and brain damage from it. And so in the United States and a number of countries test for this at birth, many countries don't. And um, so uh, aspartame is one of the things that has to be avoided by people with fetal ketoneuria. Uh, so there's that. Now, uh, I'm just showing here again that you have uh, l tyrosine being synthesized here from L-phenylalanine. I don't want to get too much into these reactions, but uh, just to have it related in your mind, um, the tyrosine is really quite important in um, production of catecholamines and um, thyroid hormones and melanin. Um, Melanin is kind of interesting, and uh, of course, it's you think of it as skin pigmentation, but you also have it in the central nervous system in a few places. Um, and these aromatic uh, the, uh, molecules, like the phenol group there on the tyrosine and the um, uh, benzyl group on the phenylalanine, they're uh, they have what are called pi bonds, and because they the resonation, uh, you know, if the Molecules that can that can smear the distribution of the electrons that are shared over uh, more configurations tend to be a little more stable. So uh, these uh, resonant molecules, aromatic molecules, are, have resonance uh, are very interesting. They absorb UV light. UV light uh, is. Uh, from 100 to 400 nanometers. And, uh, you know, you think about UVA, UVB, UVC. And I'll just tell you an easy way to remember it. If you think of like your four fingers, one to four, 100 to 400 nanometers, uh, the UVA is the uh, uh, longest wavelength and therefore the lowest frequency and the lowest energy. It's the least damaging. Uh, and you absorb UVA and UVB quite well. Um, most of it gets uh, blocked by the atmosphere, but uh, um, I think about 95% of uh, UV, UVA. But uh, I think of uh, UVA as uh, like um, Newton, Newton's lifespan. Newton died at 84. Uh, 85 uh, is the number I, you remember from um, 
doing this in my memory uh, here. Um, uh, 315 to 400 is UVA. 315 to 400 uh, nanometers is UVA uh, light. UVB is like Mozart. It's 35 is when he died. Um, because the good die young, right? And um, especially the really smart ones. And uh, uh, that's why I'm still alive. <laughs> uh, but uh, I let's see, 35 from uh, 315 would be um, 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 uh, um, uh, 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 um, 280. Um, I can do it faster than I can say it. Um, so 280 uh, nanometers to uh, 315 is UVB, and then UVC is below that, and it's, I think of it like a tortoise um, going from 100 to 180. So anyway, UV uh, light is pretty uh, significant in our existence. Uh, you think of all these aromatic uh, resonating molecules that make up your code of life, the DNA, and the pigments essentially have a uh, form a shield of uh, a, a um, um, uh, against uv radiation to that can damage your dna it's not perfect but it's uh uh you try going without it uh and i'll talk about that in a second so anyway you, this is a, an important uh uh molecule this tyrosine uh a tyrosine uh Neuromelanin was first noted in the 1930s uh, in all these different species. It starts to occur after two to three years of age. Uh, and two places in the central nervous system, it's uh, found substantia nigra, which is associated with Parkinson's when you get uh, the pars compacta gets damaged. It was first looked at in 1788 by Unsurling and the locus aurelius which is not a dopamine uh, uh, site, but it's in the catecholamines. You know why catecholamines are called catecholamines? Catechol is a benzene with two adjacent hydroxyl groups on it. So catechol. So if you start to put on um, aliphatic chains with amides or um, nitrogen groups on them, uh, they call them amines, catechol amines. So anyway, um, this isn't the slide I thought I was going to be showing, but uh, uh, this is a very interesting point about neuromelanin. This is a little side journey here, uh, but why would you have neuromelanin? where the sun don't shine unless, you know, you're getting opened up. Uh, basically, it's felt that it is possibly likely protective, that uh, it will give you protection against, uh, like, uh, I think it was um, Paraquat is one uh, herbicide that's suspicious and it's predecessor cyberquad cyberquad i think uh was uh which was banned around 1975 in the united states uh was uh one of the toxins that could damage the substantia nigra uh and neuromelanin is not the same as the myelin sheath uh, myelin sheath are involves the surrounding of nerves by very flat um um, uh, cells that act as insulin and uh, uh, that act as um, uh, insulators, not insulin. Uh, chelating, uh, chelation is it, like if you have uh, a toxic metal, um, mercury, you put a chelating agent, which is something that bonds, uh, has two. Um, uh, ionized groups on it that can grab uh, uh, the um, 
mercury atom on one end and a mercury atom on the other end and will tend then to go out the uh, urinary tract. Uh, chelating agents like throwing somebody in with two hands, a molecule in that has two hands that can grab the toxins and drag them out the urinary tract. So, in a, in a word that's, uh, yes, Phil, I think that's true. I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, better living through chemistry that uh, causes uh, worse aging. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so I'll let you uh, uh, folks look at this on the uh, PDF to go into it more. I just wanted to show a picture. One thing, and you're thinking about the neural pathways uh, that really came out in the 30s at uh, Papa's um, uh, talking about neural circuits. Neural circuits, you have nuclei, which are lumps of cells that are basically gray matter. The cells look grayish. And they have projections, which are fibers or uh, groups of axons that um, uh, go to another nucleus or project to another site that they're going to modulate. Uh, or influence, and uh, on it goes, and there's, uh, from any one nucleus, there's input and output, and there are uh, modulatory, uh, inhibitory, excitatory inputs, um, and feedback. And so you end up with loops that can be very complex, but here, this locus ceruleus has, uh, it if something, uh, kicks that on. It kicks up the, the uh, uh, norepinephrine release from the um, um, uh, 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 peripheral nervous system and puts norepinephrine into uh, sites in the uh, um, cortex, which is excitatory. And um, uh, norepinephrine is a uh, catecholamine, and so it's uh, coming from tyrosine, which is related to production of melanin. So that's why you can have uh, uh, melanin, uh, neuromelanin showing up in the uh, um, uh, uh, locus ceruleus, like substantia nigra. This is just a nice slide. It shows it's very well established. Uh, pathways uh, from tyrosine to L-dopa to dopamine and uh, norepinephrine and then epinephrine. And um, uh, tyrosinase uh, is a shoot off from tyrosine to produce uh, um, uh, melanin. I don't want to get off too much on melanin. I just thought it was kind of interesting. And it's a copper. Uh, I know somebody out there likes uh, 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 metal, organo metal, metallic bonds. Uh, it's it's an interesting uh, enzyme in that sense. It has copper in it um, as a cofactor. Uh, but uh, albinism uh, can occur, and at least ten percent or so of the uh, albinism is associated with um, mutations in. Uh, uh, fam familial based mutations rather than spontaneous mutations in the uh, that lead to reduction of tyrosinase. So that's another metabolic disease that can occur from based on genetics. Um, now, one of the interesting things to me is you you know you've got all your sugars and your in in Biochemistry just about are, are dextro. They have a dextro orientation in terms of endantomers. And all your amino acids are L-levo. And uh, why was that? I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting um, speculation about it in literature. And uh, maybe someone here will get interested and do some deep research and ponder and... Uh, come up with some ideas as to refine why we have just L orientation in our amino acids. We couldn't use uh, dextro amino acids. And, um, uh, and dextro um, uh, 
oriented uh, sugars. Let's see, someone, uh, if, if the questions can be kept uh, in the, uh, uh, I, it's hard for me to talk and, and, and look at um, private messages. Um, uh, the rate limiting step, just like the rate limiting step to making um, melanin is this tyrosinase. A rate limiting step is the, not the weak chain, but it's what determines the overall rate at which anything can be made. You know, if you've got, it's, 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 the, uh, it's the factory that causes the backup in the supply chain uh, or the shortage on the, uh, after, the, after the factory when you're waiting for deliveries. So ty tyros uh, tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate limiting step in uh, production of this chain of really important um, monoamines uh, like L-dopa to epinephrine. And uh, looking for markers associated with tyrosine hydroxylase is a good way to look for um, uh, uh, monoamine uh, neurotransmitting uh, neurons in the central nervous system. Um, one of the things I'll mention, by the way, is uh, in treatment of Parkinson's, I'll talk about a little more, L-dopa can be given and that will perk them up for a time as long as they can utilize it because uh, it, it depends on the uh, having enough cells that can produce uh, um, the dopamine from the L-dopa. Um, so uh, it's, it's one of the primary uh, treatments for Parkinson's aside from in, you know, trying to put in new stem cells. Okay, uh, boy, I, I talked too long, I'm sorry. I'm behind a little bit, but uh, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> Who can tell me, is it left the, uh, or right, the over-the-counter, um, available, ordinary, commonly used medication? or the uh, one on the right? Which one is a controlled substance? Anybody have any ideas? Okay, Phil thinks the natural stuff is left. Well, it may not be natural, it's just, elite, it's just legal. One of these is legal and the other one is uh, cooked in uh, trailers out in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, boom. I put um, pseudofedrin in kind of a rosy color there because it's a wussy uh, molecule. Nobody cares, right? It's, uh, I, I'm being facetious, an amphetamine in shaded red block letters is uh, kind of pointing out danger. Uh, yeah, it's a hydroxyl group, but it has to be in the right orientation, of course. Uh, but methamphetamine, I've came across different statements about the original history of it. The um, uh, amphetamines um, uh, were uh, discovered uh, around 1888 or 87, I think, and um, in... At 1919 or so, uh, well, it's related to tyrosine, um, but uh, it really is uh, comes from ephedrine. Ephedrine is a plant product. I, when I was uh, um, on faculty at University of Pennsylvania, I had a patient who bragged to me that her grandfather had been, she was older, uh, uh, and her grandfather had uh, gone to China and uh, found um, uh, cooking meth is pretty simple chemistry compared to what chemistry really is. Uh, it's uh, anyway. Uh, she com she bragged that um, her grandfather had uh, brought ephedrine back and popularized it. He was he was basically the beginning of ephedrine. 
becoming used in the United States uh, for vasoconstriction. Ephedrine, we used to spray ephedrine um, solution in the nasal cavity, uh, it's common, I mean, even now, uh, to decongest the nose uh, for examination. Um, or if that with a little topical anesthesia, if you're going to do a, a flexible fiber optic scope exam through nasal passage to look at the larynx or something. Uh, so anyway, uh, ephedrine, can be used to uh, 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 make pseudoephedrine. It's basically a, a sleight of hand by the chemical companies. The difference between pseudoephedrine and ephedrine is it's an in, antimer. In you look at the orientation of the hydroxyl group there on the upper left, it's toward you rather than away from you in ephedrine. And you can always look at this. Uh, um, uh, benzyl group um, connected by a carbon there, uh, a carbon uh, carbon to carbon bond as a, um, it, it can rotate and it's planar, it's flat. That's a flat part of the molecule. At any rate, um, uh, the uh, 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 pseudoephedrine is uh, chemically, uh, the, the the number of number of atoms is the same as ephedrine. It's just the uh, geometry is very slightly different. And uh, you take that off and atom methyl group, uh, uh, you can make uh, methamphetamine. Okay, what happens with uh, a normal dopamine synapse? I'm going to try to go through this uh, without going real long. Uh, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about biochemistry and then about the synaptic level. When I was in medical school, so much of uh, neurophysiology was oriented towards synapses and axonal response. The axon uh, 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 nerve impulse uh, and uh, So um, uh, anyway, you have um, down inside the um, uh, presynaptic uh, terminal, you have tyrosine being converted to dopamine, which is enclosed in the double membrane ves uh, uh, vesicle. And uh, um, I think it's a vasomonoamine transport too is involved in uh, moving it to merge with the outer membrane to uh, be released. It's released into the synapse. It stimulates receptors on the postsynaptic. I'm sorry. I have a touch screen and I'm waving my hand at it. Um, uh, the uh, postsynaptic, it's the purplish area, uh, and that kicks off a, um, a response uh, with uh, depolarization down its exon in response to the dopamine. And um, the dopamine in the synapse has to be dealt with. Some of it's uh, degraded by a monoamine oxidase. The other is taken up by a dopamine transporter and uh, DAT is the abbreviation you'll see, and that gets taken back into the cell and the dopamine gets recycled. And I guess on the right is just more about the uh, synthesis of uh, dopamine from tyrosine. Oh, this is a synapse that's buggered up. Uh, in a word, what happens, the principal thing that happens, and similar for cocaine, and methamphetamine in um, um, terms of blocking the um, DATs or dopamine transport molecules. So they block, both of those block trans, uh, reuptake of dopamine, which serves to increase dopamine, overstimulates the other cell, uh, the postsynaptic cell, 
and it gets uh, stressed. Uh, it gets oxidative stress and uh, um, uh, chronic damage can occur. Uh, and in uh, the, uh, let's see, I keep having notifications and stuff pop up in front of my screen. Um, the other thing that the meth does that the um, uh, cocaine does not do is uh, it goes into the uh, uh, presynaptic uh, cell and causes more dopamine release. Um, and it tends to last longer than cocaine is what I understand, although the half-life of uh, in, uh, ingested um, methamphetamine is um, probably officially at three to four hours. I've read 12 hours in some sources. So I'm not sure what to believe there, but the effects seem to last longer than with cocaine. And that goes for one of the things we'll talk about is psychosis that arises from use of methamphetamine that tends to last longer than one would expect with something that gets cleared in three to four hours. So uh, one other thing that happens is the uh, microglia, which are supportive uh, cells that uh, look for um, things that shouldn't be there. They tend to get riled up and release cytokines and uh, damaged cells. And um, you do this for very long and you will start to kill off uh, or really severely damage the uh, um, the synapse and the uh, uh, dopamine producing cells. Um, uh, we'll talk about that a bit more uh, as well. But uh, you do not want inflammation in your central nervous system if you want to keep thinking clearly into uh, uh, whatever advanced years you're able to get. Um, Let's see, I guess that's the main thing. Even get mitochondrial stress here in the postsynaptic. I think that's kind of interesting. There's a lot more detail. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress, a lot of um, oxidative uh, species and uh, highly reactive nitrogen species can occur that causes uh, damage to, uh, bio, bio, um, biochemical damage to the, uh, these cells. So speed is methamphetamine. Speed has no cycle. No, speed, methamphetamine is a uh, psychotropic drug and um, sympathomimetic. Uh, it acts like epinephrine to some degree. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I put the slide in basically to, um, uh, for anyone that wants to look at the PDF, they can refer to it to uh, read about the points I just made if they, uh, if anyone wishes. Um, that, I sent out the note card and that is a, a link to the um, uh, PDF for this uh, talk. I've just posted right there. Um, so I'm gonna go on at this point. But yeah, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species occur. Um, mitochondrial damage, which is really huge. I mean, that's, uh, you need those guys. Okay, let's go up above the cellular level to uh, more of a system level, uh, talking about the brain. Uh, and um, I thought it would be cool to talk about, um, I guess McCain's uh, uh, triune brain, uh, MacLean rather, um, um, uh, triune brain, which just reminded me so much of Star Trek and the uh, uh, symbolic concepts of Star Trek. Yeah, that slide was for Baragon, this one too. That's Mac McLean. Um, and um, uh, Shatner's the only one living now. Uh, 
But at any rate, um, he came out with this uh, idea that you have the reptilian brain, the limbic system, and the neocortex. You know, the limbic system was what was called the rhombencephalon, uh, the, um, the rhinencephalon. Rhombencephalon is like the um, pons and uh, below the midbrain, the pons and the medulla oblongata. Um, yeah, the nose brain. And, and he thought that was like you're looking at rats or um, lower mammals, they've got a huge nose brain. And that was what were, uh, they were the best subjects for study. And so uh, uh, um, they figured uh, uh, that was how they sorted out stimuli and such. And then uh, McLean started to think, I think that there's a fear or emotion aspect to this. And um, it uh, kind of started to evolve to the limbic system. And um, that was still not so commonly said. Uh, it, it was said by some, and others seemed to be weary of it, uh, wary of it uh, when I was in medical school. Um, uh, over the past 50 years, uh, a great deal has come a long ways. Uh, here's another little picture that shows the idea of this. Uh, you got the squash up here, and uh, the limbic system is not just this middle portion, and it's just too simple. And these systems don't operate independently. It's not like you got a reptile, you know, you can't blame your bad deeds on, uh, that's the reptile in me, you know. Uh, uh, it's all integrated. And I put a little neuroglossary here just uh, for uh, um, anyone that's interested. Um, again, this will be in the uh, PDF. Um, particularly, we're going to be interested in uh, talking about nucleus is uh, any cluster of neurons and they're like modular areas of the um, uh, um, of the of the uh, forebrain and midbrain some and uh, even some in the hindbrain there's some um, clusters of cells and they project <clears throat> excuse me axons to other nuclei so they interact, they feed back, they talk to each other. Um, did I make a big jump? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, so I will leave this for people to come back to, to refer to. Uh, in a sense, the forebrain um, and the mid, the, the, um, the forebrain refers to the diencephalon and telencephalon. The telencephalon is like the cerebrum and basal ganglia, and the diencephalon is the through brain, which is particularly, in my thinking, the thalamus, which is a, a relay center for everything that goes down the spinal cord, and uh, it uh, kind of balances a lot of stuff out. Uh, the midbrain is um, below the hypothalamus and thalamus, uh, and uh, it's a small area, really. The forebrain is, re uh, uh, the cerebrum is related to the first two ventricles. You have a left and right uh, large cavity in the, um, called ventricles. They are full of cerebral spinal fluid, and it's secreted inside of them. It perc percolates down through a little duct into a third ventricle, which is uh, basically the ventricle of the thalamus and hypothalamus. And uh, then it tr uh, it um, uh, percolates down to uh, a third fourth ventricle, which is a little cavity in the um, uh, rhombencephalon or brainstem um, pons. And uh, 
I wondered about why they called it Ram and Cephalon, uh, and because uh, there are like ra eight Ram beers, uh, which are swellings that uh, form embryologically that become the Ram and Cephalon. Uh, so it's related to a term they used in uh, embryology. And uh, that term was first used in 1895, apparently. Um, and a rom, something is a rhomboid, is like a parallelogram or four sided equal sides, I think. Uh, can be, it uh, doesn't have to be right angled. All right. There are um, four dopaminergic pathways, and I used this slide a couple times in this talk. Um, this also shows cerebellum is also at the level of the pons. In fact, the pons has this bundle of fibers that goes across uh, in front of it that relate to the cerebellum and uh, a vermis in the center uh, between its hemispheres. Cerebellum means little brain. It's not very interesting to neurologists. It's, uh, except uh, you get a lot more bang for your bu buck with uh, lesions in the spinal cord than you do with dealing with things in the cerebellum. Uh, cerebellum has never interested neuroscience as much as uh, how we think. But these uh, listed on the left here, especially the mesocortical and especially mesolimbic pathways are of interest. These are all dopaminergic pathways. Those are the only dopaminergic pathways in, um, no, and that's not right. They are the four major ones uh, that uh, might want to put in your brain. Uh, the mesolimbic, uh, uh, relates to um, the ventral tegmental area in the uh, uh, mesencephalon. Oh, I, I went on to the next slide, and well, you can read it there. Um, uh, and I don't mention that here in this, but I give a little description of what are involved in these pathways. The ones, nigrostriol uh, is a substantia nigra, which is considered part of the basal ganglia. I'll tell you in a minute what the basal ganglia are. And it projects uh, to uh, other uh, basal ganglia. And uh, that's, of course, where you get Parkinson's when you have loss of cells or loss of dopamine production in those cells. Um, the mesolimbic and mesocortical have a lot to do with motion and how you activate your body and um, uh, have emotional movement emo or uh, volitional movement and uh, um, response to emotion uh, and emotions and feelings in general are including fear are uh, in this and memory, especially episodic memory. Um, the, uh, there, uh, again, I want you to think of um, loops or uh, circuits, uh, like the Papaz circuit uh, for the limbic system, which uh, involves the hippocampal formation and uh, um, the, uh, amygdala and the uh, amygdala is uh, right in front of the body of the hippocampus. I have better pictures for that in a minute. And cingulate gyrus. Uh, so, okay, here's your hippocampus. Hippocampus uh, comes from the term for seahorse, and so now you can see why. This curve thing here is uh, the tail up is actually uh, what's called the fornix or arch um, and um, it's also closely related to the uh, uh, olfactory system 
and in the very front of, of the, the body uh, here at the top left uh, of the uh, hippocampus is uh, where you would find amygdala, uh, which is uh, part of where you get fear. Uh, that's that's thought of with fear, but I got to tell you a story about that in a minute. Before I do, let me just tell you about. I used to deal. I, I over my time, I did a couple of operations and with in combination with neurosurgeons. Most of them involved sinus disease, frontal sinus disease, where the uh, uh, sinus disease had destroyed the posterior bony plate of the sinus and eroded into the frontal lobe area, uh, anterior cranial fossa. And so I would do um, surgery in combination uh, and cooperation with a neurosurgeon. Uh, but this is olfactory bulb. It's the first of 12 cranial nerves. Um, it is the one that goes right into your brain, right into your cerebrum. It doesn't go to your midbrain or uh, brainstem. It's the, uh, it's less than 5%, maybe it's a few percent of your um, brain function is in, involves the olfactory uh, perception per se whereas it's maybe 40% in a rat. Uh, but you can get tumors off this bulb. It, it has this, the bulb has processing and such, but uh, uh, esthesial neuroblastomas, which grow down into the nasal cavity and are destructive. And uh, uh, that's, a, that's one that I've um, dealt with, uh, with um, combined procedures with neurosurgeons. Um, those are... Uh, stimulating cases, you keep awake quite easily. Um, and uh, you have this cribiform area in the roof of the ep uh, ethmoid where um, uh, little perforators come through and those are your olfactory endings. Those are basically pure brain looking down. That's like, like an open retina there. But at any rate, uh, this feeds right into um, structures associated with the limbic system. The uncus down here on the right is a cortex right over amygdala and um, the head of the uh, hippocampus. Um, and then you have primary olfactory epithelium and it projects up into um, uh, some of the cortex as well. I thought this was a good slide. It shows uh, the right, uh, well, it's actually the patients, you're looking at the base of the brain um, and the bottom of the, it's not a patient, the bottom of this human brain. And so this uh, is the left olfactory bulb. It's been removed on the right side, which is on your left, and it's marked as olfactory sulcus. At, uh, at any rate, you see how small it is compared to the overall structure. You can see down at the bottom is the pons, and that's what is related to cer the uh, cerebellum and its functions. Um, and mammary bodies are important in the limbic system and uh, part of the Pepez circuit uh, uh, as well. And you have mammalothalamic tracts the pons is at the bottom, medulla is below, out of the picture. It's not shown. Um, these are just above the pons. Uh, there are two little bumps in the midline, uh, right adjacent to each other. And in front of it, it's like if you put your fingers in a V, uh, that's the optic chiasm. Uh, the optic nerve crosses and the pituitary gland comes out in uh, close relation to the optic chiasm too. But uh, uh, at any rate, the mammary bodies are uh, uh, part of the thalamus and important in the limbic system. And uh, uh, let's see, I guess that's about all. The temporal lobes are on the left and right here. Think of, uh, put your arms with your fists uh, to your sides like in a karate stance, down down to your sides, and think of those, those are like your temporal lobes. 
and uh, it's kind of in that position. Your brain is folded, so your temporal lobes come round and forward. And uh, there's uncus. You can see uncus marked out there. Just if you look at where the mammary body is down there in uh, the center, uh, about the bottom 25% um, of the picture, just to the right and left is uncus, and that's over, that's cortex over the hippocampus. This is from an old book uh, that was made, it's classic, uh, Netter. He just did such fabulous pictures showing the hippocampus and fornix. The hippocampus is a temporal lobe structure and starts out in the temporal lobe and swings around and, uh, with the fornix and um, The amygdala are two nu uh, nuclei that are on each side in the temporal lobes that are just at the head of the uh, hippocampus. The amygdala is uh, a, a place where you process fear. Now, as I read this uh, one thing, and I've heard it discussed, uh, uh, like if you get rats and you put electrodes in the front and the back of the amygdala, if they're in a uh, safe place, like uh, a um, uh, nice, warm, cozy uh, place with food and water and soft light and no scary things and no predators, uh, then uh, the amygdala, amygdala seems to act as more of a pleasure center. Uh, but if they're in a... Uh, um, rat hell, you know, where there's a lot of fear, uh, things that could uh, cause them stress, then the front of the amygdala shoots uh, a, a lot of, uh, of um, impulses, neural impulses, and the back uh, can as well. So the amygdala can uh, adjust its function based on what's going on. It's not purely fear. It's not that simple. Uh, it's also um, a site where aggression can be uh, located, and uh, it's uh, some of sexual behavior uh, comes from that. And uh, one wonders um, if the aggression um, associated with the amygdala and sexual function associated with the amygdala gets mixed up in some guys so that they think that um, uh, sexual activity has violence and um, uh, harm uh, involved. Um, uh, it, it's an interesting question. This is looking at uh, from the brain split down the center from front to back uh, vertically and you can see underneath the uh, temporal lobe, frontal lobe to your right. I have anterior I wrote in there. And the cingulate gyrus is part of the, uh, um, and it's even more than just cingulate gyrus. It's it may now say prefrontal cortex, and that, that includes cingulate gyrus. Cingulate gyrus. Um, but that's some of the processing of the limbic system. Limbic system is not just, uh, it's part of this cerebrum, deep cerebrum. Uh, and uh, so, okay. thing I liked most about this picture, it's midline, but it shows this corpus callosum. And um, basically the uh, hippocampus uh, uh, fornix uh, runs below it, uh, but the corpus callosum is a band of associative neural fibers running from the left to the right hemisphere. And in some people, that doesn't form or it can be divided uh, neurosurgically and uh, interesting things happen. But uh, um, also, uh, you see here, they show the pituitary hanging down there like a grape. Uh, right in the center, um, in front of the temporal lobe. Um, I don't know if you can see the 
go from the center at the bottom straight up and you'll see uh, this light gray uh, thing on a infundibular stalk. That's the pituitary gland. And it is controlled by the hypothalamus, which uh, does two things. It does a lot for uh, the uh, autonomic nervous system and it has a neuroectocrine function. It sends, uh, it creates hormones that go in a portal system a, a little circulation, specialized circulation between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to stimulate the uh, receptor cells in the pituitary gland to create thyroid hormone, cortical, uh, um, corticosteroids, and uh, uh, hypothalamus is really busy maintaining the uh, uh, homeostasis. Uh, you also have, I, I mentioned uh, locus ceruleus with the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. Um, uh, the uh, one, one point I've come across is that all these structures in the limbic system, particularly, and in the thalamus are competing to control the hypothalamus. They're all talking to each other and they're all talking to the hypothalamus and they're all trying to talk down every other nu nucleus and get their message into the hypothalamus to tell it what to do. And it gets weighed out and um, that's how you deal with stress and all kinds of stuff. Okay, limbic system. These are the main parts of it. I thought this was a nice slide for it. The reason why it's important um, uh, is uh, because, let's see, I still don't, well, there's uh, in, uh, it, this is the uh, um, uh, 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 circuitry for emotions like uh, 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 limbic. Think of the bottom uh, bunch of stuff as the hippocampal formation and uh, look how it tracks it, it, uh, from the hippocampus runs up the fornix to these mammary bodies and they have mammalothalamic tracts and the anterior thalamic nuclei, it's actually called an area because it has three nuclei, talk to the cingulate gyrus and tell it what it's doing. and. Uh, um, then there's feedback uh, to the hippocampus. And it's, all this is important in, in emotion and, and processing of emotion and uh, uh, memory, especially episodic memory or explicit memory. Um, on the other hand, basal ganglia, uh, which you think of uh, putamen, caudate, uh, amygdala is... Uh, uh, that kind of fear nucleus that I talked about, um, but um, uh, down there with the hippocampus and the temporal lobe, um, th these are collectively called the stria, st striatum, um, and they are kind of a processor um, uh, for executive function. It interacts, they, these interact with the prefrontal cortex a lot, these are deep nuclei in the brain that interact with the frontal cortex to decide what to do, what, how to weigh something out and what action to take or not to take. And um, if you play piano, this is where implicit memory is in these basal ganglia and in the synapses that form uh, there. That's, uh, you, you can... Uh, um, Implicit memory means memories without a uh, condense, con um, a consolidating event necessarily. It's maybe by, you know, experience that gets incorporated and uh, by repetition, as opposed to um, the uh, explicit uh, episodic memory that's associated, especially with emotional um, things that happen. Okay, all this leads to nucleus acumens, which is kind of a major reward uh, uh, 
um, center in the brain. The ventral tegmental areas, those are dopamin, dopaminergic uh, neurons, and they send uh, um, 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 information to the, I, I said to amygdala, but also I'm, I, I think it does, but I, I meant to write, I was going to emphasize here, uh, nucleus acumens. Um, Nucleus acumens is really part of the basal ganglia. It's close in with the caudate and the uh, putamen and uh, 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 the ventral tegmental area is the target of methamphetamine. When you get uh, methamphetamine in there, it starts uh, sending uh, out uh, dopamine uh, and uh, it's uh, it's it's a dopamine uh, producing uh, uh, nucleus, and uh, its dopaminergic uh, neurons go to limbic and cortical areas, and they get a cheap reward. They get a feeling of I've achieved something without doing anything. I put this slide in just to show these um, caudate and putamen, basal ganglia. Globus, pal uh, globus pallidus is, isn't, there it is. Yeah, it is indicated there. Uh, it's not functionally related so much to the caudate and putamen, but it's one of the basal ganglia. Um, here's another slide. You can see the, the gray there. There's internal capsule. If you look, there's just a streak kind of going diagonally where that, uh, this idea of lenticular form, uh, Lentiform nucleus is kind of archaic. Uh, it's uh, putamen and, and uh, the caudate together. Um, oh, I just messed up my view. I, I hit the wrong. Uh, okay. Uh, just quickly, again, because I, I think Parkinson's is one of the interesting things about uh, uh, um, methamphetamine that people don't talk about as much as they should. Uh, Parkinson's was first described by James Parkinson, and I couldn't find a picture of him, and that's because they weren't taking photographs back then. <laughs> uh, the pictures that were incorrectly uh, or erroneously attributed to him look scary, so I could see why they would cause uh, people to shake if they saw that face. But uh, in any rate, uh, he had a small series of uh, patients, uh, plus some people on the street, and uh, I think in London, and uh, he distinguished between people with tremor at rest, which is typical of uh, Parkinson's versus tremors with motion, which is uh, like um, uh, uh, essential uh, tremor. Um, uh, Tourette's is uh, quite different. Tourette's is, is, is uh, Parkinson's. Uh, Tourette's, I don't think, uh, is uh, closely related to Parkinson's uh, at all. Uh, Parkinson's is, uh, it's, it's got a, a complex of, uh, of uh, symptoms. They get Parkinsonian facies where they basically don't show expression. They can't get going, they can't keep going, and they can't stop. They can't uh, control motor function. They even have trouble swallowing. They start to have uh, uh, perceptual hallucinatory effects at, uh, eventually. Uh, on the other hand, I think of Tourette's. I had a patient uh, who had Tourette's once, and I was writing a prescription back when we wrote prescriptions, and she took a swing at me, and I, f I heard the whoosh, the swoosh as it went by my ear. She just did crazy stuff. That um, That's a little different. Uh, anyway, um, I, I thought he was... Uh, Interesting thing to point out. Uh, 
uh, one of the things I wanted to Im impress upon you is that methamphetamine, uh, methamphetamine users are almost twice as much uh, likely uh, to have Parkinson's develop as people who never used it. You don't want to burn out your uh, equipment. And um, um, I, I, before I leave the system thing, I want to impress upon you that uh, methamphetamine, like cocaine, now cocaine kind of, kind of have an interesting common history or, or a parallel history. Coca was derived uh, and presented to Europeans, really came of interest in the 1900, uh, 1800s. And um, I guess there was a wine uh, produced, um, Vin Marina, Vin Marinia, that was wine and co cocaine. There was like two grams of cocaine per ounce of wine. And um, this was sold by this uh, gentleman, Perkinson maybe, uh, in uh, United States as um, um, a uh, beverage uh, to help you as basically he touted it as a an aphrodisiac to help your sexual organs rejuvenate and this sort of thing so uh, it was popular uh, and then uh, like 17 I'm sorry 1885 after the bad compromise in the Hayes administration and they allowed Jim Crow to resume in the South. Um, they had a temperance law in Georgia where they forbade the sale of alcohol. And uh, so this Perkinson um, uh, had to take his uh, wine and cocaine mixture and do something. He replaced the wine with sugar and called it Coca-Cola. And um, so, uh, uh, I, I think he could have gone to another state, but they're still in Georgia. Uh, and just lately, after they passed uh, new Jim Crow laws, they came out and said, those aren't very nice. But uh, um, cocaine was uh, eventually controlled. In 1914, there was a Harrison bill um, that uh, uh, regulated uh, production and distribution and uh, uh, sale of uh, opiates and coca products. And uh, basically, it was influenced by people like Halstead, who was a top surgeon in the United States, that uh, who was very famous at um, Johns Hopkins. When I was in uh, training and I did uh, general surgery for a few years. Everybody talked about Halstead, and he was a hero. And uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, some of his writings, he was a cokehead himself. He, he injected cocaine and uh, was addicted to it. And so was Freud and others. Uh, and in fact, that, that drink I mentioned with the coca and the uh, wine, uh, I think that uh, Thomas Edison and Ulysses S. Grant thought it was just great. But it was very stimulating. <laughs> of course, Grant was known to be an alcoholic, and uh, Edison liked to experiment. Uh, but uh, uh, in any way, uh, uh, Halstead wrote about uh, timid Negroes becoming unmanageable, and uh, because they become. Uh, 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 fiends for dope, uh, or, or uh, doper fiends, and uh, become a constant menace to the community. So uh, there was uh, uh, concern about uh, uh, cocaine fiends uh, among the Negroes. And so that was America. And it's just, see what Jack Johnson, the boxer, was up against. Uh, 
And so in 1914, they uh, passed that bill to regulate it. Um, and cocaine kind of disappeared from the scene until the 70s when the uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll uh, uh, scene really uh, caught on. I remember when LSD was not illegal and um, methamphetamine was not illegal. Methamphetamine was first uh, regulated in the United States in 1970. Um, and uh, when I was in college, I knew a lot of people that were doing DEX and speed and things uh, uh, and a lot of other drugs. And uh, I was... I feel so lucky. Uh, when I was out 14 to 15, I was, uh, I discovered, I didn't feel like I had much going for me. I wasn't well to do. And um, I didn't have uh, impressive clothing. My, all my clothes were from my cousin. And um, uh, which uh, uh, got me made fun of at times because they didn't fit great and they were worn. But uh, I was in uh, mathematics classes and we had linear equations, multiple linear equations, like in four unknowns. And um, they said, you got to write this down. And I tried, I, I discovered I could look at it on the board and solve it without writing it down. And uh, I got a rush out of that, uh, kind of a reward in my brain out of that. And I, sometimes the math teachers liked me and sometimes they didn't. I would turn in stuff with no uh, derivations. Or if I used derivations, they didn't like my derivations because uh, they sometimes, one of them told me they didn't know calculus. And I was using calculus, which I had taught myself. But uh, one summer, uh, and uh, I was so afraid, that's all I had. I was so afraid. If I lost that, I, wouldn't, I would be nothing. And so I was really protective of my brain function. And all this time, and I never drank much, and uh, I got drunk once in my life, and uh, uh, I never did drugs. I, I drank coffee, and I did smoke for a time. Uh, but um, um, I quit that. Uh, when I was young, and uh, uh, this stuff causes brain damage. But at any rate, uh, it's an increasing problem uh, since oh, uh, the um, well, to finish up with the cocaine in the '80s, I guess they started cutting cutting corners and um, cutting cocaine for distribution illegally with baking soda and things, and they would heat it and it make cracking sounds. And so they called it crack cocaine. And they said, that's more addictive. Well, it was cheaper. It was, so it became more popular than ever. 10, 10 bucks and you could get a hit of crack cocaine. Uh, and you had, in Philadelphia, you had teenage girls and some teenage boys selling their bodies uh, for 10 bucks uh, to get a, another hit of crack cocaine. I mean, it's just really a form of slavery, what happens with these things, but it causes deaths. Um, methamphetamine overdoses are a dangerous thing. And most recently, the Native Americans are uh, in the United States are suffering the most with that. Uh, I think people that are poor, and desperate and don't have much to be happy about, you take something like this and it makes you feel invincible, makes you feel like you've won or that you're going to win. It, one of the big things about this is anticipation. So what happens if you take amphetamine, side effects? Some of these are the same if you take a lot, you get high levels of serotonin as well. Um, but uh, you can end up with a heart attack, comas, and paranoia. Paranoia is a big thing with this. Um, one of the problems 
And here's where I want to talk a little bit, just uh, just a couple more minutes about the socio uh, uh, medical aspects of of methamphetamine use. It becomes a community. There is a paranoia associated. There's also paranoia associated with cocaine, and violence was something that's associated with cocaine use. You know about supposedly 90% of people they're using cocaine or just recreational use. They're not using it heavy, um, but uh, they're not habitual. But that 10%, they'll start using it a little more frequently. They'll start during the week and then they'll start daily and then they'll binge. They'll go days, they'll stop eating, they'll stop sleeping, they lose their job, they lose their family. So they get really down and out and they're a mess and the only thing that makes them feel good is more uh, methamphetamine. There's, there's stories like uh, uh, a woman, she's, and it's a problem because methamphetamine crosses the placenta as well as the blood brain barrier. So it gets to the baby. But a woman that, uh, this is not at all uncommon, uh, was pregnant but using methamphetamine quite a lot um, after the baby was born. The family was there to see the new baby and oogling and ogling, and she felt nothing. She felt nothing. It couldn't compare to what she felt when she got meth. So it's a tough problem. There's really no cure for this. Uh, they get into a community where you're either in or you're out. If you're not a, if you're even an occasional user of meth, you're out. They, they don't trust you know anybody that's not a heavy user and they can see that they're heavy users. Yeah, it destroys the teeth and the people that are heavy users, they'll start with bruxism where they grind and crush their teeth and fracture them and um, um, neglect dental hygiene as well. And long-term heavy use can lead to psychosis, among other things, death as well. But uh, the uh, psychosis can last for over a day and sometimes longer. And uh, I was going to talk more about history, but I don't want to go on and on. I put this slide in for people that are interested. These are three interesting articles about how governments exploited their young uh, mostly men, but now it's men and women, but uh, uh, methamphetamine is not used the same way now um, in, in militaries, at least in the United States. But the Germans, it was, a, it was an over-the-counter medication of methamphetamine available in, in Germany during World War II. Um, Hitler was a, a meth uh, freak. Uh, uh, it was used in soldiers to keep them going. And when the war's over, what then? They're screwed up. So there's a there's a lot to, a lot of hypocrisy and a lot to be concerned about here. Uh, one last picture. You look at these. Uh, the, you can do this with PET scans or uh, specialized MRI scans. Um, and these commercials I'm making fun of, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there we are. Uh, too far. Uh, they didn't work. They were pretty striking. This is, uh, this is your brain. This is your brain on uh, um, bad memes. This is your brain on uh, drugs. Uh, okay, that's pretty striking. Somebody that doesn't use drugs or someone that does, they think that's lame. Um, and uh, one of the things I wanted to make a point of here, lastly, is that uh, people that do these things cause changes in the physiology of their, of their brain. Dang it. Sorry. Uh, they lose dopamine function. And um, the uh, healthy brain is to the left and uh, in the upper left-hand corner, and the uh, person who's been a heavy abuser of dope uh, of, of, of uh, methamphetamine is on the right. 
and you see a lot less dopamine activity, and that can last at least 36 months. And I think uh, there's some um, literature that suggests there are permanent changes. So I know to say no isn't easy. Uh, it's going to take more than a village to make people quit. They need a lot of support, acceptance, and um, uh, that's about it. Thank you, Della. Delia. I say things, I always mispronounce things. So, any questions? If you want to read stuff that's really cool, one of the things I enjoyed the most in medical school was neuroanatomy. And um, it's really been refined. We had a uh, stodgy uh, older woman who taught neuroanatomy and she had published and was very dry and would only show cold um, diagrammatic anatomy. And then we had labs uh, examining brains and brain areas and we also did histology. Um, and uh, there was, it was frustrating for me because there was so much stuff and I was like, oh, what in the world does all this stuff do? How does it interact? You almost need artificial intelligence to understand the brain. There's so much uh, going on between areas. I went over a little bit. I appreciate everyone sitting in uh, through this. And thank you to everyone. Uh, was there a question, Stephen? I missed it. I'm sorry. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for coming, Synergy. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you, Max. Um, okay. There's a new approach to dealing with epidemics of addiction to think of it as an epidemic of an infectious agent. How much do you think that approach will help? Well, I think it is a disease. This is like a disease and approaching it by punitive, legalistic, uh, kind of archaic um, schemes is fraught with failure. Um, and it's going to, uh, uh, psychiatry and psychology are, um, as, as uh, applied sciences are really lacking in the psychiatry if they have anything for which they can't just give a medication say that's it uh then uh it's uh uh a lot of work and uh the things that are easier um uh, kind of take precedence um but it's it's going to take big social uh structural changes and in, in the way people are dealt with and the support they get if they're stuck on meth. The other thing is meth is uh, causes toxic waste sites. It you, you go stay in a motel room, you may be staying a place which has toxins and um, uh, uh, dangerous chemicals. Uh, as residues uh, in the air or on the surfaces that were used for cooking meth. There's all this mobile uh, meth labs and things like this. It's not really hard to make, and I re refused and uh, explicitly did not uh, talk about how it's synthesized, as I don't think anyone needs to know that really.
but yeah, I think society needs to needs to regard it as a disease. You know, you look at the brain and so little of what we do is attributable to free will or if any, uh, or uh, they put a person in jail because their amygdala screwed up, basically. I mean, it's really uh, striking. Uh, you have to deal with people by their actions if they're danger to others. Uh, but uh, it's one of the reasons I really don't accept the death penalty. I hope I gave a reasonable answer to that. Oh yeah, Stephen Daines uh, of Montana was complaining that uh, uh, they used to have homegrown meth in Montana. Now it's coming from the cartels in Mexico. Like it's suddenly Mexico's fault. Yeah. What a jerk. <laughs> Thank you, Shiloh. I was thinking this exactly, Phil, what politician brains look like. I think about like that, uh, many of them about like that egg on the left in the middle with the pepper on it. Kind of a lot of coagulated protein and a fat glob in the center called the yolk. Yeah, meth labs are very dangerous and um, they don't take precautions. They're dealing with, I mean, with uh, flammable, um, uh, and volatile agents and uh, uh, getting chemicals from all kinds of places that uh, then they just put in the garbage and it's not being disposed of properly and things aren't being cleaned down properly. And they're not trained or oriented towards safety. Yeah, especially when it turns brown, Phil. The nitroglycerin to make it home. The brown stuff, you got to really walk easy. <laughs> and the fumes are coming off of it. <laughs> Thank you, Baragon. Thanks, Stephen. I've never seen Breaking Bad. I saw an excerpt of it, but um, um, I'm not sure where I saw the excerpt, but, um, and I know that actor, uh, not personally, but. Sorry, Max. Oh, I, I had one last thing I'll tell anyone who's here that's still interested. Uh, how to increase your own dopamine levels naturally. So for those who are still here, if you want to jack up your dopamine levels, exercise, walking. Walking is great for making new synapses and uh, um, it'll jack up your uh, dopamine naturally. Nature, nature is a, a good way to uh, uh, improve natural pleasure responses. Nutrition is important. Good nutrition, healthy nutrition. Meditation, which uh, like um, Shiloh does, that uh, would uh, 
I think, and naturally increase. Uh, gratitude and attitude. Have a good attitude about life. Think positively. Look for positive aspects to life and the things that work for you. Again, I was like, I could have come out a lot of ways. And again, I just feel so lucky I was, uh, I, I kind of got stoned on learning stuff. I got a rush out of learning stuff. And uh, it was like a drug thing for me. So learning a new thing was gave me a sense of gratification. Yeah, it's a great thing, isn't it, Max? So being grateful for what works for you and, you know, sticking to it. Goal achievement, setting yourself a goal, something doable, and then do it. And then, of course, dopamine's also involved in the anticipation of a goal because it's part of how the brain uh, learns, oh, did I do this before? How did I do this? And how did I get that? And now they, how do I do it again? It's sort of the uh, old, is it still there? And is it, does it still feel good type of thing? And uh, finally, go out and make some happy memories. And dwelling on happy memories, if you can, choosing the memories you dwell on or uh, is uh, better than dwelling on negative memories. So th that's all I got. <laughs> yes, dopamine is really important in learning. Oh, thank you. Once again, I'm posting my uh, uh, PDF for anyone that would like to download it and um, or have access to it. And uh, does I think there were good diagrams overall? I only had one place where I would have edited it a little differently if I were to do it over. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate your attention and interest. See you, Phil.